Hi, welcome everyone. We were so thrilled to have uh, such a wonderful turnout for this session, um, and uh, I just want to welcome you all to it. And uh, thank you for the uh, active engagement that we're going to be asking of you. So don't get too comfy in the seat that you're sitting in, because there's going to be um, some true breaking out happening here. Um, I'm Rebecca Nesson. I work at the Extension School and Summer School. And together with Aaron Bauman from the Kennedy School and my colleagues, Adrian and Karina, we have uh, planned this session to help take us from the big picture of thinking about teaching evaluation that we had in the plenary down to the smaller picture of focusing on a single course, perhaps a course that you teach or a course that you've worked on, and thinking about how the teaching and learning in that particular course might be improved without overhauling the entire syllabus, without changing the fundamental style of who the teacher is as a teacher. So we're looking at smaller types of interventions that can make a big difference in the experience of the teacher and the students in the course. And we started with um, a, a couple of hypotheses of the types of uh, these changes in courses that we've seen make big differences in our experiences working in teaching and learning centers. Um, so first, uh, changes that help us to create engagement, to make sure that the students' minds are focused on what's happening in the class while they're in the class and actively engaging with the material, and also when they're working on uh, activities outside of class. Secondly, building trust within the class, forming a sense of community and relationships between the instructors and between the peers in the class so that the students really are comfortable and open enough to be ready for the learning and the learning experience that um, we're hoping to create in the class. And uh, then thirdly, to provide students with the tools they need to actually assimilate what they're learning in the class, so to help them focus on the right pieces of uh, the, the right concepts that you want them to take away and to uh, think hard about those things. Um, so to help us do this, we have invited two distinguished faculty members to give us two brief talks about their experiences with activities that they have designed that are along these lines and that have made transformations in their own class. So we have uh, Emily Click from the Harvard Divinity School and Jonathan Hausman from the Harvard Medical School who are going to share with us their experiences. After that, um, we are going to do a larger uh, activity where we all move around the room and you'll get a chance to uh, play with these uh, mysterious decks of cards that are sitting in front of you. Uh, but we're going to start off uh, with creating our own community for this session with a little icebreaker of our own. So for that, I'm going to pass it on to Erin. So for this, it's kind of going to try and channel some of the exercises that we may have done in primary school. So I'd like at your tables for everyone to count off one, two, and three. So here, skipping Jonathan and Emily, we will go one, two, three, and then one. So just do that at your tables. Everybody count one, two, three, and then we'll, we'll break out. Don't worry. Now that it sounds like everybody has a number, I'd like everyone who is a one to come and sit at one of these three tables. Everyone who is a two to come and sit at one of these three tables. And everyone's a three to come and sit at these three tables. All right, another one, of my, another one of my revelatory primary school tricks. Now that everybody has gotten to their new tables and put themselves up in new groups, we're going to give you a chance to go back and do what it sounds like you were already starting to do, and that's get to know one another at these new groups. So at your new tables, if you want to group yourself into groups of kind of three or four, so it doesn't have to go around the whole group, but just groups of three to four, I would like you to take you know, kind of the next five to 10 minutes and share your name, share your role, where you're from, what you do, and then share a problem or an opportunity for improvement that you have encountered in a course you're teaching, a course you're taking, or a course you're working on. So name, role, and a problem or opportunity for improvement in a course that you're teaching, taking, or working on. All right, so now that you've all had a chance to get to know one another a little bit better and to kind of think about some of the teaching challenges that you're bringing in with you, I would like to invite Emily Click from the Harvard Divinity School up to share some of her teaching practices with us and specifically to talk about her practice using the classroom contract. 
Uh, so it's great to be with you. I'm looking forward to learning from all of you. And let me just begin by asking you to think for a minute about a, a particular class or classroom type environment where you function. And if you can think of a one word adjective for what you hope will characterize that learning environment. What would it be like in one adjective? Has anybody got it? We've got to have extreme extroverts to answer this, but you know, some people are like me. Anybody got a, one? Yes. Stimulating. Stimulating. Uh huh. Anything else? Nimble. Nimble. Uh huh. Exciting. Exciting. Yes. Engaged. Engaged. That's actually my word as well. Um, so you get a thousand points. Can somebody <laughs> put that on the board? Um, so uh, none of us said passive right? Uh, it's not what we dream of, but that often is what winds up happening in our classroom. So I wanted to just give you a little bit of a story and then just some of the nuts and bolts of, of what I'm doing with um, what she was calling a classroom contract or the language of public agreement. So the story that I have to tell is a not very attractive story about myself, which is that um, about seven years ago, as I was teaching, I began to realize that students had their expensive laptops open. And we usually, in the Div School, you know, kind of have a kind of square of students. And the students whose uh, screens I could not see, someone reported to me, were posting on Facebook and were um, checking their email and so forth. And boy, did I get my nose out of joint about that. You know, it was a, well, you know. How could they be doing that? They're not focusing, they're not learning, and very insulted and so forth. And you know, after a while I realized, um, oh, that's about my ego, isn't it? <laughs> Began to get a little bit of a sense of humor about it. Where I really got the sense of humor about it was when I was sitting in an administrative meeting where somebody was making a presentation and I had my very expensive Harvard paid for laptop open and I looked at my screen and realized I was checking my email. And um, I thought, well, isn't that interesting? I'm getting insulted when the students are doing that, and I'm doing exactly the same thing. Maybe it's a legitimate thing to do. I don't know. But if it is a problem, to whom does the problem belong? And I realize it doesn't actually belong to me, except for my ego getting bruised. But apart from that, it really belongs to the students. And following Ron Heifetz's advice, uh, you give the problem to the people to whom the problem belongs. So this led me into the Keegan, Robert Keegan and Lisa Lascalehi stuff on creating a language of public agreement. And so I started doing this. And let me just tell you, if you get tempted to do it after I tell my story, when I first did it, it felt just like when you're standing on a cliff and you're a little too high above the water and it's, you know the water's cold and you're going to jump off anyway. That's kind of how it felt as it was very vulnerable to start asking the students what kind of learning environment they wanted to have, including the use of computers. Because, of course, I knew the right answer was that they shouldn't be doing things like posting on Facebook and so forth. But instead of me giving the answer to have that engaged classroom, they get to create the learning environment that will work for them. So I started having this thing, and I, I just actually did this yesterday with my class. So it was the third week of school. Obviously, you can't do a shopping week, and the second week is still all this logistics. But very early on, I spent an hour with a student saying, what do you want to do about computer use? It does a couple of things. One is it pops a hole in the balloon of you're pretending you're not doing that, and I'm pretending that I don't notice that you're doing that. Um, so that we can be real with each other, which is a part of being truly engaged in the classroom, bringing your full, real self. Um, it also has happened that students have helped each other to understand that they get distracted when they're sitting next to somebody who is doing Instagram. And it's far more powerful if they hear from their peers what the effect of actions is than if they than if I impose some kind of rule. So that's one of the areas that we discuss. Another area that I lead them in discussing is what do you do if you have not prepared for class? And I, I let them decide, what do you do? 
Okay, so this is, turns out to be far more effective than the professor saying, I want you to read everything before class. Because we all know that people, you know, the, the, the record on how much people read is, is abysmal, right? So I feel like it's my job to make what happens in class such an exciting exercise that pulls on the readings and they're working with their peers that if they haven't read, they're at a disadvantage to enjoy and have fun with their peers. or Not just fun, but, you know, deep learning experience with regard to the material. That's my job. But they need to decide, do you still come when you're not prepared? Again, it's poking a giant hole in the balloon of students pretending that they're fully prepared and professors pretending that they don't know. Because, of course, if you've taught the material for a while, you know in a second if somebody has not read it. <laughs> but you're supposed to pretend like you don't realize that. So what I now have often is, you know, they decide how are they supposed to identify if they have not prepared. And sometimes an underprepared student can be an advantage if you leverage it correctly. So if, if you put the underprepared student in a small group with other students who are prepared, the prepared students then take on the role of teacher and they get to learn the material more deeply. Does that make some sense? So it doesn't have to be a lose for everybody when the inevitable happens. So a couple of other areas we discuss. One is confidentiality. As you can imagine, at the Div School, sometimes the material gets very personal. And I think that's also true in many of your classrooms as well. And so what are you supposed to do if something is shared that's very personal? Are you allowed to talk about it when you go home or with other people at the Div School? And so forth. And then the fourth area is a very significant one. And and the way I usually phrase it is, what do you do if the teacher says something that's racist? Like, as in me, you know? I, I just, again, poke a giant hole in my wish and desire to never make mistakes. And I still have that desire, and I still feel awful when I do make mistakes. The, I decided a long time ago I did not want to read on teaching evaluations in July that I stepped on somebody in February. <laughs> you know, this is just no fun for anybody. And it also damages the learning environment so crucially when uh, actions or words do harm, either by the professor or other students. So instead of pretending, again, like this will never happen, which then, of course, shuts down the people who do get harmed by such harmful speech or actions, I set it up that this may happen especially when we're talking about things that matter a great deal. What do we do about it? Now, in all of these areas that we discuss, and there's more than I'm listing right now, part of the point is to have a clear agreement about what the norms are for the classroom. P more to the point is to have a norm for what you do when the norms are violated and broken. If you don't have this discussion, then any, everybody has in their minds what the norm should be. But it's different. So when you've had the discussion, you have a way to capture the learning that can come about in these moments of difficulty. And most importantly, this surfaces, and I think today overall is supposed to be about evaluation, my own deep conviction that while teachers and professors have a huge amount of responsibility for what happens in the classroom, I don't, I don't abrogate my responsibility one bit because I tell the students I'm still bossy, you know. <laughs> um, but I'm not the only person responsible for the learning that's going on in the classroom. And it is so awesome. I said it was like being on the edge of a cliff. Let me tell you, when you jump into that pool, you find out how trustworthy those students are, how impressive they are, what leaders they can be, and how beautiful it is to see them build learning community. But all of your students are as well. That's what the work is that follows um, the educational experience. So I like to give them a real-time experience of how hard it is to build community. Do I have one more minute, or are we at the end? Um, <laughs> lined it up. Um, so one, I'll just tell you a, a really brief story. One time I had a, a relatively small class and a couple of students were taping the class and a couple of other students 
felt they didn't feel comfortable to fully participate because the class was being taped. Those who were taping were English as a second language learners. So there were really legitimate concerns on both sides. So I engaged them in a full discussion of it, didn't get resolved. Had another full discussion of it, didn't get resolved. I didn't resolve it. Students got really, really angry with me. I got emails and, you know, this is your job to resolve this. And a little while later, I was teaching the Ron Heifetz material about the flight to authority when problems get really difficult. And as I was teaching that, they went, oh, that's what we were doing. We were fighting to you to resolve things that you were saying belonged to us. So that's it. So I want to thank Emily for sharing not only her story, but also such a really powerful teaching practice that can help both in the area of creating connections and increasing engagement. So thank you for that. And now I'd like to invite Jonathan Hausman from the medical school up to share some of his teaching practices with us. Thank you for inviting me. So um, I'm a rheumatologist. Uh, and every year we go to our national rheumatology conference. It's usually held in fancy places like I don't know, Chicago and San Diego. And it's five days of really intense, break, uh, you know, breathtaking lectures about all sorts of different topics in rheumatology. And I remember one time several years ago, um, after I came back, my wife asked me how it went. I said, great. Then she asked me, what did you learn? And I really, I sat there for a while, <laughs> and I really didn't know what to say, because I didn't remember much of the material um, that was presented during the conference. And then I, I sort of, that's when uh, my interest peaked about, about how we learn, and um, I sort of started doing some research about cognitive learning theories. And I realized that lectures, sort of like what I'm doing now, are a lousy way for people to learn, right? So just by sitting there, uh, you're being very passive. You're not doing any learning. Um, so, so it's not very effective. So thankfully, I thought, OK, good thing it's not just me. It's the lectures. So you know, I read a lot about uh, active learning and how really you know, we should get rid of lectures. And tons of publications have shown the benefit of active learning for the learner. But here I was in my medical training. Uh, things weren't changing, right? We still had grand rounds, which was a lecture. We had journal clubs, which is a lecture. We had case conference, which is usually a lecture. And all of my didactics were still lectures. So I said, OK, I can't get rid of lectures. So how can we make a lecture more effective? Well, there's a lot of ways that professors can make lectures more effective. And sort of the tool that I learned was uh, through questions. So we talked a little bit about questions this morning in the panel. And the really, the, the great thing that I like about questions is that they are a form of retrieval practice. OK, so questions not only assess whether your learner actually knows the material, but it actually enhances those neural connections for that information. So that next time that they are asked uh, that question, they know it better. So questions actually help people learn and help people retain that material you know, throughout their learning. Like we said this morning, it's not just about you know, how you do on the test, but it's how you remember that stuff 10 years down the road and how it affects your career. So great. So I found out that if the instructor provides uh, the, the audience with questions at the beginning of the presentation, that can actually help to increase curiosity throughout the lecture and makes people learn things better. I learned that if the lecture provides an opportunity for, um, to ask questions in the middle of the presentation and have students try to apply the material that they learned in a new setting, that that's also effective for learning. Um, and then I learned that if the instructor provides a short quiz after the lecture, that also helps to enhance learning, and those students do better on the tests you know, weeks or months later on. OK, that's great. But still, my professors weren't doing that. 
all those good things that the literature supported still wasn't happening. So I said, okay, that's great. So what can I do as a learner to try to make those experiences more effective? And sort of what I stumbled into the literature was this idea of learner-generated questions. So learner-generated questions. So these are questions that the learner asks and answers after any educational experience. So if it's a lecture about lupus, at the end of the lecture, I would think about, OK, what was important about this lecture? How can I make that into a question? How can I answer that question? And the literature shows that learner-generated questions are as effective for learning as instructor-generated questions. So that's kind of cool. Um, what the literature also says is that learn, if you teach your learner to generate their own questions, for example, after a lecture, it actually changes the way that they see the lecture. It actually, the, the, it's sort of like a metacognitive strategy that can be employed um, whereby they are able to, as they are listening to the lecture, to start thinking about questions and start answering in their mind, okay, this question came up, here's how I would answer it. And the studies show that if you teach them these skills, they actually learn the lecture material a lot better. And the same thing has, uh, has been shown after a reading material. So if you ask them to read an article and ask them to generate questions and answer the questions after the article, they retain that material much better. Okay, so that was pretty cool. So what I started doing during my fellowship was just that. So at the end of every case conference, journal club, grand rounds, I would generate a question. I would do a multiple choice question uh, with the answers. And then I would start sending it to my co-fellows. And they kind of liked it. And they got really engaged. And I noticed that they became more engaged in the lectures because they knew that I would test them in the end. And these were tests that you know meant nothing. Uh, we don't get graded in, in our fellowships very much. So, and then the attendings started, my, my bosses started to really get into it, and they wanted to participate too. And our nurses started participating as well. So I was generating the questions, and then I would send it out to the team. Uh, but then they wanted the opportunity, you know, I realized that the question generation was probably the, uh, that's where sort of the most bang for your buck uh, came from. So it's not necessarily answering other people's questions, but I thought that by me creating a question, that's really allowed me to sort of distill the material and, and make it my own. So then I decided, okay, for every lecture, you know, I will assign somebody to generate questions and then we'll distribute it amongst ourselves. So I took that a step further. Uh, a few years ago, I got a Hilt uh, Spark grant to actually create an app to do this. So the way that the app works is that um, the learners can generate questions and answers. And uh, this gets distributed through people uh, within the same course. And so not only do the students get a benefit from generating their own questions and answers, which I think is the best thing about it, but then, then you have this beautiful question that you can share with your colleagues and they can try to answer your question and also provide feedback on that, on that question, um, saying, you know, it's a good question. No, I didn't understand this. Um, so uh, so it, uh, it was a, a great tool, and we sort of piloted in the medical school and learned a lot about how students learn, what they liked about the app, what they didn't like about the app. Uh, and there were certainly some things that, um, that we needed to fix. And, um, we actually got a, a, a second Hilt development grant to uh, sort of buff up the app and, and make it even better. But you know, these skills of question generation for your learners doesn't require an app. You know, you can just you know get them a note card. Right at the end of class is like okay, right on the front of the note card. You know, one question that um, this uh, presentation brought up, and then write down the answer and. You know, they get a benefit from that, and then they can share that um, with their classmates, and, and so that everybody, sort of everybody, wins. So that that's what I've been doing. So stay tuned for the app. The app is called Ask 
ask up. Uh, it's uh, so it's out there now, but it's uh, we need to do some updates. But hopefully by uh, next year we'll have a working app that it's free to use, and I, I would welcome uh, use of the app in in your classrooms. Thanks. All right, thank you so much to to Emily and to John for sharing some of your experiences and how they really have had an impact on your classroom and on your students' learning. Um, and what our hope for today is that you can all come away with some ideas for how you can make small targeted changes to your teaching um, that are not so big that you need to overhaul your syllabus or have that enormous feeling of vulnerability that we often feel when we're trying to make changes. Um, these are all things that can be done in a variety of different class sizes and in um, a variety of different times. So oftentimes less than five minutes. So this is when we get to the mysterious cards on your table. If you want to take a minute and just turn over those cards. We have another activity. <laughs> All right, so there's a number of different decks. You can kind of separate them out here. And here's what we are going to do. Back in the icebreaker, we asked you to think about a challenge or an opportunity for growth and for change that you have identified in your own course. And Emily also brought up this idea of having an adjective that of what you want your course to be like. And so what these cards are, are a way for you to find ideas of solutions to those challenges. And what we want you to do is, in a second, we're going to ask you all to stand up and walk around the room again, um, is find one or two solutions in these cards that you think might solve the challenges that you identified. Or if you see one that might work for one of those people you were talking to in the beginning, you can grab a card for them too. Um, so you'll notice the cards are divided into different categories. In our front three tables here, we have cards related to active learning and to what we call mini experiences, which are ways of taking an experiential learning um, activity like a role play and doing it in a smaller form that isn't so big to take on. Um, in our second row here, the middle three tables, we have cards that relate to community building, um, to icebreakers, which are really a form of community building, and also to small group activities. So if when you were listening to Emily, you were thinking, wow, I really want to have some ideas for how I can better build community in my course and get my students engaged that way, those middle three tables have ideas for you. Um, and then the back three tables have ideas for what we've called um, structured study, which is if the challenges you're thinking about are, my students aren't getting as much out of the reading as I wish they were, I wish they had more study skills or more directed study for outside of class, there's ideas there. Or what we call setting the stage, which is things you can do in the first five minutes of lecture to try to get your students more involved and engaged and to activate some of that recall. So if what John was talking about was appealing to you, you want to head to those back three tables. So um, we will be um, your goal, find two cards. You're going to have about 15 minutes to do this. We're going to do the poll. Yes. And we are launching a Poll Everywhere poll. How many of you have ever used Poll Everywhere? All right, a number of you. Um, so what's going to happen? Erin's going to pull it up on the screen. You use your cell phone to this. for this. It will give you a number to text and um, the message that you're supposed to text. So in this case, the phone number that you text to is 22333. And you text that phrase, HILT2017. And it will come back to you. It'll activate the poll. And what we're asking you to do here is if, as you're coming across these cards, um, you see any ideas that you might want to implement or that you might have ideas to adapt, you can um, text your ideas to this poll. And they'll all go up on the screen so we can all share them. Everybody clear on what we're doing? 
So can I ask everyone to make your way back to your icebreaker group? So because we're going to end with an opportunity for everyone to share with each other ideas that you've had from finding a card that might apply to someone else's opportunity for improvement, uh, or just whatever thoughts that you might have uh, have had as you looked at the cards. Um, and as you're getting there, uh, I would just like to. Um, uh, mention a couple of things about the cards. So first of all, um, uh, our, our apologies for not already having these available for you to have as a, a, um, a digital copy. That's something that um, we can easily do and intend to do. We just didn't get around to it before this actual session. So um, in some form in the HILT conference follow-up, you will receive a, a link to where you can get the PDF and download all of these cards. We'd like to also make the templates uh, available so that people can uh, add. There are many other great ideas, obviously, I think many of you are having as you go around about things that fit in these categories. So we'll be doing that. Um, the second thing that I wanted to mention is that the, uh, the idea with the cards was that the little ones are easy for you to pick up and take along with you. Um, and you should certainly feel free. So take as many cards as uh, are sparking an idea that you'd like to pursue. So what we'd like to do uh, to finish off this session is to have you continue in the small groups and uh, speak with each other about ideas that you found interesting um, and perhaps to have a little opportunity to recognize the ways in which even implementing these small ideas is a little bit like jumping off a cliff. So thinking about how they actually function in the context of your classroom because um, sometimes it's not quite as simple as a little card makes it look. Um, so please enjoy those final conversations, and this will be the moment where um, we thank you for your participation in this session, and uh, um, let's just all together give ourselves a, a round of applause, and particularly our speakers. Thank you.